We like to look at things and figure out how to get around things and f*** with things. The reason I'm committing crime right now from inside your offices with you guys in the room with me is because you guys are watching porn. Why the hell not? And we like to f*** with things. If you ever meet me online, that's your f*** ass. No, I've not hit rock bottom yet. Come to find out, I've got a load farther to travel. But we really have problems with authority. I'm a criminal that, uh, that chooses not to break the law. At some point, you've got to take responsibility. I'm Brett Johnson, former United States Most Wanted cyber criminal, now good guy, and host of The Brett Johnson Show. Today's episode's a solo one. We're going to talk about the art of accountability. And since it is a solo one, and here's the thing. I guess you guys uh, you guys know I've got a production team in now that is, is helping me to no end to try to make this show successful. And I am beyond grateful for that. It's just... Um, you know, I've been doing this thing for, geez, I've been doing this for for about four years. I had the online broadcast and the Anglerfish podcast and the Brett Johnson show. Then that got yeah, banned from YouTube. <laughs> and then we're back. This is my 100th episode. 100 of these things under, under just the Brett Johnson show. And um, I had my agent, Josh, he told me the other day, he's like, you know, you really don't even get started until you get 100 of these things under your belt. And I was like, well, dude. Hopefully, I'm able to get started now. But, uh, you know, the, the production team I've got, Brian, Shana, they are uh, they're outstanding. And like I said, I'm, I'm beyond grateful. We split the show up into two. And the reason is, is that uh, no one really knew, probably myself included, what the Brett Johnson show was about. You know, I, I, someone had sent me a message a few months back saying, you know, it really seems like your show – is kind of a show on therapy that's just kind of cloaked into cybersecurity. And I was like, you know, that is not an unfair assessment. So, and I had to agree with that. And, and you know, th this production team, Shana, she explained to me, hey, you know, nobody's finding your ass except by accident and nobody knows what your show is, but you've got good content. So we, so we split it up into two. And, you know, we've got the Criminal Thoughts show and then we've got the Brett Johnson show and we're doing a lot of interviews. But I want to keep doing the um, the solo stuff every now and then because I, I got to be honest with you, it, a lot of it, a lot of the reason I do these shows is because it helps me grow too. It helps me think things out. You know, I talked about the death of my father. I've talked about uh, overcoming the addiction to cybercrime, about trying to be a better person. And when it comes right down to it, I think that that is a lot of the um, the main line of what the Brett Johnson show is about of me just trying to, uh, of me learning what it is to be a better person. And that is not, that is not an easy thing. I did the Jordan Peterson show a few weeks ago. It's supposed to air in a couple of weeks, late December of 23 is what it's supposed to air. And that show was basically a, a two and a half hour counseling session for Brett Johnson. And I needed it. That's the thing I needed. I, I decided long ago that, uh, and I, I've had therapy. I have, and it's a very good thing. And Lord knows I need it. But I decided, you know, hey, maybe I can, maybe I can, you know, show what it's like to try to, to try to fight these things and, and come to terms and be a better person in front of people. And I fell a lot. But sometimes, Sometimes I'm okay. So what we're talking about today is the, the title of the episode is The Art of Accountability. And it's going to be a segment on the Brett Johnson Show. Just a short segment. It gives little tidbits of how to take responsibility, how to be a better person. And, and I'm not preaching. I'm simply using the experiences that I've had, the problems, the trials and the errors, 
that I went through and, and trying to uh, be better than what I have been. You see, I'm already getting choked up. So it comes with it, I guess. The thing is, is um, I spent most of my life not taking responsibility for much of anything. I blamed my, uh, my sister, my family, my wife, my stripper girlfriend. I blamed everybody but me for my lot in life and for my choices in life. It got so bad. Shadow Crew made the front cover of Forbes, August 2004. October 26, 2004, United States Secret Service, they arrested 33 people, six countries, six hours. I was the only guy that was publicly mentioned as getting away. There were a couple others. Secret Service, they were not bad people. They were inexperienced. They did not, uh, they did not understand at that point in time the mindset of cyber criminals. They did not. They, they, they likened us to regular street criminals, and that's not true. We are to a degree, but we have problems with authority. And I know all criminals do, but we really have problems with authority. We do not like to be told what to do. We do not like to be micromanaged. We like to look at things and figure out how to get around things and fuck with things. That's what we like to do. And sometimes we like to make money when we do it. But a lot of the times we just do it for the friggin' hell of it. They did not understand that. So as I was working for them, I continued to break the law from inside Secret Service offices for the next 10 months until they found out about it. Then I take off on that cross-country crime spree, still $600,000 in four months, wake up one morning on the United States Most Wanted list, Go to Disney World. Yeah, because why the hell not? Go to Disney World. Get my yearly passes at Disney and Universal. Camp out at the parks. Take the roller coasters. The nights are spent at strip clubs. Lasted a few weeks. Secret Service gets me, arrests me, sends me to prison. I escape from prison. I think people know that. What a lot of people don't know, and this goes back to this thing of me not taking responsibility. You know, I blame them. The reason I'm committing crime right now from inside your offices with you guys in the room with me is because you guys are watching porn. Why the hell not? That's, that's not true. I guess it was about two months into the investigation. I had this New York Times writer. His name was Tom Zeller. I think he, uh, he, he quit the Times. I don't know if that had anything to do with me. But he quit the Times. And for a, t for a while, he was at National Geographic. I have no idea where he is now. But... What happens is, is one night, about two months into this 10-month span of me inside Secret Service offices committing crime the entire time, I get a message on ICQ from Tom Zeller in front of the agents. And he tells me he's a New York Times writer. Now, he did not know that I was an informant slash consultant snitch at that point in time. But I quickly told him, not in front of the Secret Service. They, uh, they forbid me or forbade, or however, you, whatever tense you want to say, to contact Tom Zeller. Well, the thing is, is back then, again, we have problems with authority. And we like to fuck with things. Back then, they told me not to mess with him, to leave it alone. I had it in my head, because most cyber criminals have it in their head. Most hackers, if you want to call us that. Have it in our head that, hey, once we get caught, if nothing else, we can do the speaker circuit. You know, we can work for companies and be a consultant and everything else. And the truth of the matter is, is no, by God, you can't. Nobody trusts you. Yes, I do that. But I am a bit of an outlier. Any criminals out there watching this bullshit, believe you me, you ain't working for one of these companies. They ain't going to bring your little monkey ass on stage to tell everybody how much money you stole from them. That ain't what this is about. But I had it in my head back then that, hey, you know, I, I'll, I'll do all this bullshit. I'll be all right. I'm going to be OK while I was breaking the law. So I, after that night's session at the Secret Service office, I just went out, got on another computer at a Kinko's and messaged this Tom Zeller and told him, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm Brett Johnson. And guess what? I got caught a few months ago and I'm working for the Secret Service. And he was like, oh, shit, no kidding. I was like, yeah, no shit, no kidding. 
So he starts flying down from New York to Columbia, South Carolina to visit an interview. Man, I'm giving this motherfucker, I'm giving him every single bit of information that I possibly can. I'm leaving out the part. I'm absolutely leaving out the part that I'm breaking the law the entire time. No need for him to know that. I was there for 10 months until the Secret Service kind of, sort of, maybe figures out that, hey, this son of a bitch, Brett Johnson, is breaking the law. So they revoked my bond. I was only under state charges at that point in time. The judge rules that the Secret Service had revoked the bond improperly, so they let me out. No one calls the Secret Service. One of my first phone calls is to Tom Zeller because I've still got it in my stupid ass head that I'm going to have a book. I'm going to be a speaker. I'm going to be this guy. So I call Tom Zeller. He flies his ass down before I take off on the run, mind you, because at this point in time, I've decided I am not staying in South Carolina. I think that I will go elsewhere and set up shop again. So Tom flies down and he's interviewing me. And this story has a point. He's interviewing me. And he's got a photographer there and he's taking pictures and all that stuff. And uh, at the end of the interview, he had to have known that I was about to take off on the run. He had to, the way he was acting, some of the questions he was asking. The last question the guy asked me, and I remember it, word for word. He looks at me, he's like, Brett, I just wanna ask you one more thing. And I was like, yeah. He's like, uh, why did you do it? And I looked at Tom dead in the eye and I said, Tom, I did it all for Elizabeth. That was my stripper girlfriend. And Tom looks at me and he had this you know, kind of disgust on his face. And he, he, his exact words were, God damn it, Brett, at some point, you've got to take responsibility. And you want to know the truth? I had no freaking clue what that guy was talking about. I didn't. To me, that was responsibility. To me, I had convinced myself, I had convinced myself that I had did everything for her. And before that, I had convinced myself that I did everything for my wife before she left. And before that, it was my family and my sister and blah, 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 blah. And I guess that's what I'm wanting to, you know, that's what we're talking about today is how do you get to the point where you accept responsibility for your life? Now, my, my story is, is way out there compared to a lot of people, you know. United States most wanted, criminal, victimized, hundreds, maybe held, held thousands of people, built a, a structure of cybercrime that's still in play today. Nothing to be proud of. So how do you, how did I get to the point that I accepted your responsibility? And maybe, maybe me telling this story today helps somebody else out there. I don't know. I can hope because uh, I got to be honest with you, I don't... Uh, I make my money talking about cybersecurity and cybercrime. But what's important to me more than anything is trying to be that better person. My mom, and I'm not blaming my mom. My mom is who she is. That's one of the things you find out. You either you, you have to accept people for who they are. You can't you can't live your life hoping that somebody is something that they're not. You either accept them or you don't. I, I accept my mother. I don't talk to her because it's unhealthy and toxic, but I absolutely accept her. And I love my mom. She's crazy as shit, but I love my mom. She spent most of her life, I can't think of one instant, not one, where she was ever accountable for anything that she did. She tried to, uh, she tried to poison my father. She never, uh, never accepted responsibility for that. My dad at one point tries to uh, divorce her. I was very young. I shit probably eight, nine years old. And uh, my dad was going through the divorce proceedings. And uh, it was me and my dad living in an apartment. And uh, my mom and my sister, you know, they were off. That's, I guess that's the Eastern Kentucky way. You know, the girl goes with the mom. The boy goes with the dad sometimes. Shit, I don't know. But I remember I was asleep because it was a one-bedroom apartment. My dad slept on the sofa. I slept in the bedroom. And there was some ruckus late one night. And I walked in, and my mom 
come to find out she had climbed through a window and was holding a knife to my father's throat because she didn't want her son stolen. We were always viewed as property. That's, that was the, uh, the love transaction. We were property. She, we were her children. And uh, she never accepted responsibility. The way she got out of accepting responsibility for that she uh, once she realized that you know her son saw that and the, the ho- I guess the nightmarish horror in my face, she gets up, she goes to the bathroom, and then the, the only thing that was in the bathroom were those safety razors, you know, those big razors, and she tries to slice her wrist with the big razor, and that way she she shifts the subject from what she just did to becoming the victim, needing help, and the reason I say that is that's something that I was very good about. You know, it's, it's, it's not my fault. I don't have any other way to make money. I, I have to do this. I don't, uh, I, I've got bills to pay. I've got, uh, I've got a relationship I need to keep care of. Uh, she's addicted to drugs. I need to make sure that she's going to be okay and stays off them. I have to be around her all the time. There was always some reason where I would shift responsibility and, and go like that. And it's, um, truly is amazing to me and I'm not tooting my own horn but it truly is amazing to me that I was able or given the opportunity to accept responsibility for my actions and the the way it started with me and I'm I'll go into everything so I you know I ripped off the secret service and uh, go on that cross-country crime spree Make the United States most wanted list. Go to Disney World. So I'm at Disney World. They used a trigger fish device to get me. So trigger fish is this cell phone simulation box, cell phone tower simulation box that can track a cell phone within seven feet. Not vertically, mind you, but horizontally. Okay. So they know where you are in a column of seven feet. That becomes important. Because if you're in an apartment building, they don't know if your ass is on the, in the basement or if your ass is on the 30th floor. Comes to find out I was on the third floor. It took them a few door knocks to find me, but they did. So they threw me in a county jail in Orlando, the Orange County Jail. Now, most county jails, not most, but some county jails, you, you have separate holding units for federal and state inmates, okay? And they don't mix those. Some county jails do. This one was one of the better ones. So they separated the federal inmates from the state inmates. And this was, uh, I had served three months in county jail before. So I had a taste of it. But you know, this this was basically where Brett Johnson is starting to hit the bottom of the barrel. No, I've not hit rock bottom yet. Come to find out I've got a shitload farther to travel. But I sure thought I'd hit rock bottom. Anyway, there's this guy named Yeti. And Yeti, one of the things you see, like like I was called OG a lot. I was also called Stave Puffed the Marshmallow Man from the Ghostbusters movie because at some point I was a little heavy. You get nicknames in prison. Like most African Americans are named black. I have no idea why, but that's a fact. And that's just the way it is. This guy's name was Yeti. White guy about 5'8", long white hair, long white beard. You can guess where the name comes from. He was in for methamphetamine charges. Now, here's a little tidbit. I had never even seen methamphetamine until I got to prison, and then I saw it. Anyway, he was in there for meth. I have a history of people looking out for me. For some reason, I guess they see my dumbass face, and they're like, you know, this guy needs all the help he can get. So Yeti takes me under his wing. He's teaching me how to prison. So the reason you go to county jail is, you know, if you're going to get some time, county jail educates you on how you need to act in prison. Because if you don't do that, if you don't learn that and you get to prison, chances are you're going to get your ass beaten because you have not shown respect and you've not done things the right way. Are you washing your hands after every time you go to the bathroom? Oh, shit. That's trouble. Are you snoring too much? Well, let's yank your ass off that damn top bunk onto the floor. That's the kind of stuff that happens. That's what you learn not to do in the county jail. So Yeti, he takes me in under his wing and he's teaching me how to prison. I didn't know that's what it was called back then, but that's what it's called. He's teaching me how to prison. 
So we're having a talk one day and he's like, you know, Brett, the only time you get off in federal prison is the drug program. And I looked at Yeti and I was like, well, Yeti, I don't do drugs. And he looks at me and he's like, well, Brett, you can find a drug problem. Can you not? And I was like, Yeti, I can find a drug problem. So they gave me diesel therapy. When they are really pissed off at you and they were really pissed off at me, when they're really pissed off at you, what happens is, is they want to wear you down emotionally, mentally, physically. And the way they do that is when they're transporting you, they stop at every county jail along the way. They let you get processed through. Now, processing takes anywhere from four to sometimes eight, nine hours. They let you get processed through. You hit your bunk. Shortly after you hit your bunk, your name comes over on the intercom saying, Johnson, pack your shit. And they move you to the next county jail. And it's a process. So to get from Orlando, Florida to Columbia, South Carolina, took me over two weeks. And I was worn the shit down. Yeah. Anyway, at every single county jail you go to in processing, when you're filling out the paperwork and talking to the processing person, you know, the, the cop, the, the guard, whatever you want to call it, behind the counter, they ask you, do you have any drug problems? And my answer was, well, yes. Well, what drug problems do you have? Alcohol, cocaine. I need all the help I can get. Now, here's the thing. I didn't start drinking until I was 34. Don't use drugs. Never have used drugs because my mother was an addict. Yeah, I didn't want to be like that bullshit. So I, I was scared to death of drugs until I was in my mid-30s. At that point in time, once my wife leaves, I started to drink. And believe you me, I tried the best I could to make up for lost time. But this point in time, this is what I'm telling every place that I stop. Drugs, you know, cocaine, alcohol. So by the time I get to Columbia, South Carolina, I've got a paper trail of drugs. This guy is requesting help. This guy needs help. Now, my lawyer was none other than Strom Thurmond's son, Paul Thurmond. Now, if you guys don't know who Strom Thurmond is, Strom Thurmond was this racist senator way back in the 19 whenevers that launched the longest filibuster ever. Now, I mean, he was hardcore next gen. That's this guy, dead now. His son was my lawyer. Until I got to Columbia, South Carolina, at which point, they informed me that, well, Brett, you cannot pay for a lawyer with stolen funds. And I'm like, and? Well, they made me drop him. Well, they didn't make me drop him. They dropped him for me. And they gave me this public pretender. No, I didn't say defender. I said public pretender. He looked exactly like Billy D. Williams from the malt liquor commercials. I mean, the Jerry Curl, everything else. That's this guy. He actually did one good thing for me. The one good thing he did as they're doing the arraignment, he asked the judge if the judge will order a psychological evaluation. Why I would need a psychological evaluation, I'm sure I don't know. You guys can probably tell I'm completely normal. Anyway, the judge says yes. Psychologist comes to the county jail. It's a four hour interview. About halfway through, psychologist looks at me. He's like, do you use any type of drugs? Yes. What do you use? Cocaine and alcohol. Cocaine. Do you smoke or snort? Snort? How much? An eight ball a day. And he looks at me and I look at him and we're silent. Finally, he's like, that's a lot. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, do you have any trouble out of that? And I was like, yeah. He's like, what? And I was like, I can't get an erection. And he looks at me and I look at him. Now, I had gotten that from watching the movie Boogie Nights. Those who have not seen it, Mark Wahlberg is this porn star. In the end scene, he's done so much cocaine that he can no longer stand to attention. And I figured that shit had to be right. I tell this psych that. He's looking at me. I'm looking at him completely silent. Finally, I break the silence. Is that right? And he looks at me and he was like, it could happen. Is it still happening now? And I looked at him. I was like, nope, working fine. Not that I need it to where I am. So that makes it into my pre-sentence report. Federal sentencing. Before you go in front of the judge, because here's the thing. If you get indicted federally, your ass is going to plead guilty. If you do not plead guilty, you are suffering from FIS, 
FIS, fucking idiot syndrome. So most people, 87 some percent, plead out because that's the smart move. Before you go in front of the judge, before he gives you time, the probation office and the prosecutor's office, they sit their little monkey asses down and they do an in-depth background check on you that tells the judge how much time the judge needs to give you behind the fence. That drug stuff makes it into my pre-sentence report. Now, while this is going on, I am absolutely adamant that I am not going to stick around if they sentence me to any more than 60 months. My guidelines were 60 to 75 months. I was like, you know what? I'll do 60 months as long as they give me the drug program and I'll be just fine. I'll get out. I'll set up shop again and I'll be all right. Sentencing day. The prosecutor is literally screaming. And he's screaming this. Johnson has manipulated the prosecutor. Johnson has manipulated the Secret Service. And Johnson is manipulating you today, Your Honor. We demand the upper limits of the guidelines. The judge looks over at me. And she says, I agree. 75 months. I look over at the lawyer, at my lawyer. I was like, uh, can you get the drug program for me? He stands up. We order the drug program for Mr. Johnson. The judge says no, but I'll recommend he gets evaluated for it. I look at my lawyer. What does that mean? My lawyer, you're probably not going to get it. My exact words. How soon can you get me to the camp? And he looks at me. and He's like, well, if you don't appeal, I can get you there pretty quick. And I was like, my exact words again. I was like, you know what? Fuck the appeal. Get me to the camp. I'll take it from there. He looks at me like I'm the biggest idiot in the world. Six weeks later, I'm at the camp. Now, I had had family and friends look for minimum security camps that were not supposed to have a fence because I was sentenced to more than you know 60 months and I was not planning on staying. So... I picked Ashland, Kentucky, not supposed to have a fence. Pull up to Ashland, Kentucky six weeks later, 14 foot fence, razor wire on top. I'm like, well, shit, I can't climb that. Go in, as I'm talking to the processing guard, I ask him, I was like, hey man, are there any jobs outside of the fence? And he looks at me, he's like, well, yeah, you can work in the national forest. And I was like, no, I'll die out there. And he's like, well, you could always work landscaping. And I was like, well, shit, I can run a weed eater. So the next week, I walk into the landscaping office. And the guard, the office, back behind him, like back behind me, back behind him, the entire wall is a blown up photo of the compound in the outline area. So I can literally sit there and plot my escape as I'm talking to him. While this is going on, my dad starts to visit. And I love my dad. My dad passed away uh, October 2nd. You you guys who have watched my show, you know, I did the, an episode speaking of the death of my father. But I hadn't talked to my dad. I mean, really talked to the man. I hadn't talked to him in, geez, 20-some years, maybe longer than that. He shows up at my sentencing and tells the judge I can live with him when I get out and wants me to get a good start. He starts to visit me in prison. Third visit in. Third visit. He looks at me. He's like, you know, I've been reading a lot about you online. I'm like, yeah. He's like, yeah. He's like, you know, that's a lot of money you made. And I was like, yeah. He's like, do you think you can teach someone how to do that? Now, the truth of the matter is, it took me a long time because I would flip flop on my reasoning behind that. The truth of the matter is, is that my dad had a bit of a criminal mind too, obviously. But my dad also just wanted to talk to his son. And me, being the asshole that I am, fed into that and manipulated the man into helping me escape prison. And that's how I escaped. Now, there's a point to this story. So what happens is, is I escape, of course. I'm gone for a few weeks. U.S. Marshals Campus, a three-state area. They finally find my ass. End result is I, um, I spent eight, well, we'll get to that. But I spent like four or five months in a county jail again. And um, at my sentencing, Secret Service is there, prosecutor, my public defender from another state, Kentucky this time, prosecutor stands up, you know, your honor, if you could take into consideration that Mr. Johnson was engaged yet again in identity theft and tax return fraud, we would appreciate that. 
the thing is, is they couldn't charge me with that because when they came in the hotel, they seized that shit without a warrant, meaning they could no longer use that evidence against me. I lucked out. The judge looks at him and says, no, not going to consider that. If you're going to charge him, you should have charged him. Then he looks at me. He's like, Mr. Johnson, I have no idea why you did the things you did. But it looks like by you keeping your mouth shut that you're saving yourself a serious charge. And I looked at him. I was like, yes, your honor. Then he picks up the PSR. Now, where the escape happened so soon after the initial sentencing out of South Carolina, they used the exact same PSR. Picks up the PSR, pre-sentence report. He's flipping through it. He's like, you know, it also looks like before you got involved with all these drugs and alcohol, that you were a pretty good citizen. And I looked at him and I was like, yes, your honor. So he says, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you 15 additional months in prison. And I'm like this. Hmm. He said, but I'm going to order the drug program for you. And I'm like, hmm. Now here's the thing. And I don't like to brag about this, but this is absolutely the truth. The drug program gives you one year off plus six months in halfway house for a total of 18 months. I was sentenced to an additional 15 months, which means that by me escaping prison, I actually got out of the prison three months earlier than I was supposed to. Now, that's not the point of the story. It's a fun little tidbit, but it's not the point. The point of the story is it turns out that by me lying about my drug addiction, which I didn't have one. That was the best lie that I ever told in my life, the most beneficial lie. No, not all lies cause harm, but this was an absolutely beneficial lie because it's one of the key components of me turning my life around. And there are several. It's not like a one trick pony with me. I, I was given opportunity upon opportunity. The Secret Service, they were good guys. I blamed them for everything. It took me a while to figure out, no, they're not to blame, idiot. You are. But the Secret Service gave me an opportunity. I had opportunities through college. I mean, I had opportunities. I just, I just did not follow them. I chose to commit crime and victimize people. So... The things that got me turned around, and I, those who have, who have watched my show, you guys know this. My sister had disowned me, not because I was a criminal. Denise absolutely knew I was a criminal. She disowned me because of that stripper girlfriend. I was married for nine years. Lied to my wife all nine. Took her three years to find out I was a criminal. Next six years were me saying, I've stopped. I will stop. I'm going to stop just a little while longer. You like spending the money, don't you? Until she figured out, oh, he ain't going to stop. And she leaves. And I go nuts. You know, that's when I start drinking. That's when I get depressed to the point of suicide. Call a psychologist. Tell her everything. She's like, get your ass in here right now. And I do. She's trying to get me to stop breaking the law and to go into real estate. And I'm like, is there a difference? Because I was that asshole. And, and what happens is, is I meet Elizabeth. You know, I'd, I'd never been to a strip club. I was that clean cut criminal. Didn't use drugs. Didn't drink. Didn't go strip clubs. Didn't whore around. One night, you know, I see the psychologist. I was like, well, shit, I'd like to get laid. Go to a strip club. Why not? I've not been before. Walked in. I'm literally that guy that falls in love with the first stripper that he sees. That's me. Bright. I loved her. I did. I did. I was. Uh, looking back now, I absolutely I was head over heels with that, that woman. Found out uh, found out after she moved in with me after I moved her in with me. Found out she's addicted to cocaine, not only addicted to cocaine, but prostituting herself to support her habit. And that, uh, if you have feelings for somebody, that will absolutely tear you wide open. It didn't tear me wide open so much that I stopped breaking the law. I lied to her about that too. And that's something that I, that, that absolutely still haunts me today that uh, that trying to reconcile that love toward and, and, and that committing crime at the same time because I absolutely didn't care enough to stop breaking the law. But my sister, Denise, she disowned me because of that. I got engaged to Elizabeth. She disowned me. 
for a year. For a year, a little bit more than a year, Denise didn't talk to me. And that's when Shadow Crew makes that front cover of Forbes. I get arrested, uh, rip off the Secret Service, go on the run, U.S. Most Wanted list, go to prison, escape prison. That whole time. After I get caught on the escape, I'm at a county jail. My dad comes to visit. And the reason my dad come to visit, he was scared to death that uh, that I was going to tell on him. And I, I never did. Then not till I got out and I actually talked it over with the some FBI contacts and law enforcement, they were like, you know, you're okay, man. So I started to tell that story. And uh, my dad comes to visit while I'm at that county jail after the escape. And he's like, son, can I do anything for you? And I was like, yeah, you can tell my sister I said I love her. I tried to call her. I tried to do everything. Denise wouldn't pick up the phone. And she was my family. She really was all I had. So uh, dad calls her and tells her, he said, Brett wants you to know he loves you. Denise, uh, she was pregnant with my niece. She gets in the car and drives seven hours to come see dumbass Brett for 10 minutes. That's, that's how long the visitation was. See me for 10 minutes to tell me she loves me. And then I disappeared for the next five and a half years. Did eight months in solitary confinement. Then they sent me out to West Texas where the streets, no shit, the streets get so hot that warnings come, come on the radio telling you what streets not to drive on because they're fucking melted. That's where I did most of my time. And it's at that point, took about two and a half years behind the fence. And I don't know, I, I'm sure that prison had something to do with it. But what had more to do with it was that, that disconnect from my sister, from that family, from that person that, that really, really meant something to me. She had, uh, she had cut off all contact. She had, you know, she had had enough. It took me two and a half years behind the fence. And I think prison probably did have something to do with it because you got a lot of time to think. You know, people that are in prison, you can spend your time on the weight pile lifting weights. And I got to do that. You could uh, spend your time in the TV room. You can spend your time on Millionaire's Row. That's where all the old guys that like to reminisce about their crimes, they go and sit on these benches and they tell each other war stories like they're still doing the shit. You can spend your time any way you want to. But again, I was very fortunate with my time. I had a guy, another guy in county jail, and he, he took me in under his wing. He's like, you know, anything you don't like about yourself, you can change while you're in prison. Use it as a beneficial thing, not as a detriment. Don't spend your time gambling, watching TV, bullshit like that. And I didn't. So it took me two and a half years of a walk on that track of just thinking about things. And that's a long time. It took me two and a half years to realize, you know, I didn't, I didn't commit these crimes for for my family or my, my, my sister or my wife or my stripper girlfriend, I, I committed them. I victimized people because I chose to, because I wanted to. Now, that's a tough pill to swallow. But that's a pill that when you swallow it, it absolutely precipitates change. If you know that you are the cause of your lot in life, Whatever shit you're going through is because of your choices. And you, you actually accept that. I guarantee God damn to you, you will change who you are. You will make different choices. Now, that's the first step. Remember that drug program I told you about? RDAP. It's called the Residential. And, and Brian, if you'll bring up one of these screens for us. It's called the Residential Drug Abuse Program, RDAP. It's a nine-month program in prison. This is the program that I lied to get. That I was like, hey, I'll get my ass out of prison a year early. And I, you know, I went in thinking, hey, this is about drug rehab. I don't have a drug problem. I'm good to go. Come to find out it is not about drug rehab. It's cognitive behavioral therapy. It teaches you that your thoughts determine your feelings. Your feelings determine your actions. So if you can change your thought process way back at the start of this bullshit, at the end of the line, your actions will change. So you could, just by saying that, you could probably guess if you take that shit seriously, if you actually let it sink in, it can have a profound effect on one. Now, here's the thing. I'm a slow learner. My RDAP time, nine-month program, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 
you know, all your your peers are calling you out for any bullshit that you're doing. The uh, the counselors are there. They've got these professional counselors that are there with you all the time, everything else. And they're pointing out every single thing that you do. And, and remember, I'm the guy. I like to blame everybody else but me. So I didn't have a problem at all pointing everybody out. And that's a problem in prison because prison is all race based. All right. So as a white guy, I am not supposed to call out Hispanic guys or Asian guys or 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 African-American guys. I'm supposed to call out white guys. My ass didn't care about that shit. My ass was calling out everybody to the point that it almost caused a riot on the compound. And this was at a very peaceful prison. I had gotten transferred from from Big Spring over to Fort Worth, which is absolutely where you want to do prison time. The squirrels on the compound are tame, tame enough that they eat out of your hand. They'll crawl up on you. They'll sit on your lap. They'll sit on your shoulder. That's fucking great. So here I am, idiot, about to cause a riot at the most peaceful compound in the entire federal system. It was not going well. Finally, I get my dose of, of therapy of when they're calling me out. And um, it was discovered that I had very little humility, a lot of ego, and I didn't feel a whole lot of empathy for anybody. A big surprise. And they roasted my ass alive. Really, that's when uh, that therapy really started to take hold. You know, they teach you things, uh, they teach you things like thinking errors. And we all have these things. They teach you things like, uh, you know, the, the, the word should. And I mentioned that earlier. You know, he shouldn't act like that. You shouldn't do that. It shouldn't be this way. You know what? You can, you can say should or should not as much as you friggin' want to. It isn't that way. And you thinking that is a thinking error. It is. You either accept someone or the situation or you don't. If you don't accept it, work to change it. But you, you, the, the idea of change, of, of should, is not a proper way to think. Same thing for, and I've got a friend that, uh, that often says, I'm a good person. If you have to tell somebody you're a good person, you're probably not. And criminals are, I was very bad about that. Very bad. I compartmentalized my life. I, matter of fact, I told people that, hey, in the real world, in the physical world, I'm a good guy. Give to charities, help the homeless, everything else. You ever meet me online? That's your fucking ass. So I compartmentalized things. I, I tried to convince myself that I was a good guy. And that's very common in criminal behavior. You, you always try to do something that, that balances out the bad that you're doing. That way you can tell yourself at the end of the day that you're good. If you really accept who you are. If you're objective enough. And that's another thing they teach you to be objective. If you're objective enough to know that, hey, honestly, dude, Brett... You a fucking asshole, man. I mean, you, Jesus, dude. Did you do anything, anything at all that helped anybody, really? No, no. And that's, again, that's this tough pill to swallow. But that's what RDAP teaches you. It teaches you these things. It teaches you uh, humility, gratitude, open-mindedness, objectivity. It teaches these traits and it ingrains those in you. And you have to do these exercises, bam, bam, bam. When you're calling somebody else out, you see somebody that does something wrong. It's not about blasting them. It's about, hey, this is what, this is what, what happened. You know, this idea, and you hear a lot of guys when they first start, I wasn't thinking. Well, no, you were thinking. You were thinking the entire time. The question is, what were you thinking? And so you start to walk through this. And if you're able to verbalize these things, if you're able to notice the problems that you've got, and if you really accept the, the, the idea that your thoughts determine your feelings, so they're not the same. They're absolutely not. If you accept that thoughts come first, and those thoughts will absolutely determine what feeling that you're having, and then that feeling results in an action. So if you can just pause for a minute, take a breath, and consider things. You know, if you're if you're going down that thing of, oh, I've got it worse than anybody in the world. Well, no, you really don't. You really don't. People have got it a lot worse than you do. Today I'm, you know, I'm a free guy. And uh, there are times, I was telling a guy today, there are times that I miss prison. That's probably not something you're supposed to say. But uh, you know, in prison you've got a degree of honesty, you've got that camaraderie. It's almost like family there. Everyone's kind of in the same friggin' boat. 
Everyone's kind of looking out for each other. It's, think of it as kindergarten, except there are a few third and fourth graders with knives. That's what prison is. But uh, there are times that I, that I miss that because of the, of the straightforwardness and the honesty that's not part of the free world. You know, if you can accept that if you can take a pause and just reconsider things, look at things from a different angle, and that that will give you a different feeling and a different outcome on things, it absolutely makes a difference. And as I said, with me, shit, I, I mean, I had opportunity upon opportunity. I got out of prison 2011, recidivated. Yeah, I went back, absolutely went back. Then my wife, now Michelle, and the FBI, that's the point where I, I finally let this thing take over. You know, this 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 thing of, I, I said in another show, I'm still a criminal. I am. People like me to say reformed. I'm a criminal that uh, that chooses not to break the law. And that means a lot more to me than, uh, than saying I'm reforming or reforming or recovering. It means a lot more to me that because that, that shows a degree of strength and choice that I am actively making in my life. That's, it's that owning responsibility. It's being accountable. It's not easy. Jesus is not easy. You know, I'm, I'm worried. Uh, I'm worried a lot about stuff. I guess that legitimate people have been worried about forever. You know, paying bills. Is the job's going to continue to come? You know, uh, my dad. Like I said, my dad passed away October second, just a couple months ago, and. Uh, I'm adamant these days about doing the right thing. I don't, uh, I typically don't see the world anymore. I used to see it. I used to gauge everything in shades of gray. And these days, part of my recovery is, uh, is more black and white. I typically, uh, I, I don't try to, uh, uh, make things abstract as much because with, with the way that I am, that abstract, you know, seeing things in gray. Well, it's, it should be okay here. It should be okay there. Um, absolutely would, would lead to me committing crime again. So I see things more black and white because that's what I need for my recovery. My dad died. He had been dying for, for a year. I moved him in with me. And uh, that entire year, my, my sister, nobody came to visit him. I had to, uh, I had to bitch my sister out. In order for her to just call and check on him, I think she only called him three or four times. And because of the way that that ended, she's not talking to me in two more months. You know, I guess uh, I guess I pissed her off some. You know, with the uh, way things fell out at the end, because I I called her to. Uh, she called me and I I told her, hey, I don't want to hear any excuses. You know, and I guess she. Uh, is one of those that is not ready to uh, accept her part in that. Not that he wasn't to blame too, but yeah. Sorry, I got off on a sidetrack there. The, the, the point is, the point is, we live in a society today where there are tons upon tons of excuses and reasons and arguments and debates that allows one to not accept that they are the master of their own fate. You know, we try to blame it on our parents, on our uh, geographic location, our neighborhoods, on systemic problems. We try to blame it on everything else. And when we do that, that allows us to wallow in self-pity. And I have done my fair share of wallowing in self-pity. It's very comfortable. You can say nobody wants to do that. Oh yeah, you find comfort in that because when you're when you're wallowing in that self pity, you don't have to act. You don't have to take that step out into the unknown where you don't know if shit's going to work or not. And that's a very scary prospect. You don't have to accept that responsibility and look at yourself in the mirror and say, "Hey, you know, I was a piece of shit," or "Hey, you know, where I am is my own fault." You can wallow in self pity and blame everybody else but you, and that's very comforting. It's a very scary prospect to change one's life. I got to tell you something. It's it's worth it. It's not an easy path. I'm still trying to learn this bullshit. 
but it's absolutely worth it. So I guess the reason I'm doing this show today, because I have people, I, you know, I've had a lot of people in the past that they'll, they'll see me do a show and I'll talk about stuff like this and they, they reach out to me and they thank me for talking about, you know, I'm glad you talked about the abuse that you went over or the way that you, you know, abused somebody. I can't help but to think that, that, uh, that that's what matters most. You know, that idea that, that by sharing our stories and our experiences and the troubles that we have, and the way that we sometimes are able to overcome those troubles and the fight and the struggle that we do to overcome those troubles, I can't help but to think that, that, that that's got to, it's got to make you not only a better person, but it's got to make you or the world maybe a little bit better at the same time. So that's, uh, that's the thought I'm going to leave you with. This is the Brett Johnson Show. And, you know, we've split shows up into two. We've got the criminal thoughts, which uh, talk about all things crime, past, present, future, how to protect yourself, mindsets, everything else. And probably it's going to bleed over into the Brett Johnson Show and maybe vice versa sometimes. And I guess that's all right. I don't know how to end these shows these days because, you know, I end my show with the same phrase. And I guess for right now, that's all right. Maybe I'll add a little tagline on today, too. I don't know. But, you know, stay safe out there. The world is a messed up place. I don't think that, uh, that we should live our lives paranoid or scared. I think that we should trust each other. Because that's important. When you live a life and you're, you're distrustful of everything in your environment, that, that's a miserable existence. So I think we should trust, but we should always be cautious, knowing that there are predators in every single environment. And while they not, may not be targeting you, that doesn't mean they're not out there. That doesn't mean to be scared. It just means to be aware. So stay safe. Stay vigilant. That's what I'm talking about. Stay vigilant. Stay secure. You know, don't, don't think that uh, somebody else is going to take care of you. You are the master of your fate. I'm the master of my fate. And I talk about doing the right damn thing. That's how I end the shows. Just do the right damn thing. That can mean any number of things. You know, that uh, there was a guy a long time ago that said, you know, treat your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others and love thy neighbor. That makes a hell of a lot of sense. And I, I can't help but to think that uh, if we could just follow that, do unto others and love thy neighbor as thyself, can't think. I just I can't think that's a bad thing. It's got to be exactly what we need to be doing. I mean, it would make things a hell of a lot easier as, as human beings with each other. I'm Brett Johnson. This is Brett Johnson Show. I want to thank you guys for uh, for taking the time to listen to me today. This is not uh, this is not the usual type of show, but every now and then I need to. Uh, Every now and then I need to come in and uh, do some self-therapy. I'm Brett Johnson. Just do the right damn thing. Thank you. Thank you.